Whether you're in person or joining virtually, I hope you were able to enjoy a little lunch break and catch up with some friends. Um, if you're here in person and you need any help finding your way around, just want to remind you that there's plenty of fig mates around wearing those blue config tees. We're literally here to help you with anything you need, so please reach out. Um, and if you're on virtual, we're in the chat. Say hello and reach out if you need anything. Deep, deep. Okay, next up, we have Jory and Noah from Font Awesome. They're here to share how they drew 30,000, yes, you heard that number correctly, 30,000 icons in Figma, and these icons are now used in over 200 million websites worldwide. I'm already so impressed. They're gonna show how using Figma for the icon family has enabled deeper collaboration, teamwork, and systems thinking. And better yet, I think your teams are all gonna learn a little something too. So let's please give a big round of applause for Jory and Noah. Hello, everybody. Hi. Wow. You all look fantastic. And especially folks online, thank you for dressing up for this. Yes, I love it. Oh, thank you. Um, so first of all, uh, hello. We are, uh, I'm Jory, and this is Noah over here. And we thought that, um, you know, to introduce ourselves, it might be a little bit easier to, uh, you know, give a biography of each other, write our own uh, biography, because, mm -hmm. you know, writing a biography for yourself is no fun, as you all probably know. We had a hard time even doing it for the Figma website there. So um, to start with, uh, I'm going to just introduce Mr. Uh, Noah Jacobus here. Yeah. This is Noah. He is a fantastic icon designer and illustrator hailing from Grand Rapids, Michigan. He has worked for a number of amazing companies over the year, including MetaLab, Google, and actually done work even for Figma here. Uh, now, Noah, I don't know if you, if you follow him on social media, you know that Noah probably has, he has an unhealthy obsession with the color yellow. I know he is, uh, he's wearing a blue shirt right now, but um, that's to throw you off, because yeah. if you look at his shoes... Just limiting it to laces today, we're taking it easy. But. Yeah. Do you have any other yellow on you? Maybe. No, he wouldn't... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he wouldn't tell me if he, if he did. Anyway, Noah is a fantastic icon designer. He brings a thoughtfulness and a creativity to everything that he does. Uh, Noah, I'm so happy you're on the Fawn Awesome team. Please, everyone, say hello to Noah. Oh, thank you. Um, and this is Jory Raphael, uh, and he has gray hair. Yes. Was that all you wrote? Yeah, I, I actually forgot we were doing this part, so just, uh, just keep it rolling. That was fine. That was okay. It's cool. Yeah, no, no. Anyway, we'll just move on. Okay, so uh, thank you for joining us for a talk. We drew 30,000 icons in Figma, and so can you. Now, for a little bit more context, you can kind of get a, a glimpse into what we were thinking about as we were pitching and writing this talk. We thought we'd share some of the alternate titles that we're thinking of, um, so you can get a glimpse at that. Yeah, like this one, the absolutely definitive guide on how to draw icons in Figma. We thought that might be a little too grandiose, not to mention patently untrue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maintaining your library with icon fidence. <laughs> yeah, no, no. no. <clears throat> and then, you know, oops, all icons, which, yeah. you know, icons is alike, but, you know. Yeah. But regardless of the title, this is a talk about very small pictures. Icons, pictograms, ideograms, whatever you want to call them, we love them, and we are lucky enough to spend our days creating them. Now, Noah and I both work for Font Awesome. Font Awesome is an icon library and a toolkit that is used on over 200 million websites worldwide. And our goal at Font Awesome is to take the hassle out of using icons on your websites and your projects and, and in your apps. Put another way, our goal is to save folks time. Now, I know that we are using a, a floppy disk icon to represent save in the <laughs> year 2023. I'm just kind of seeing if you are all still awake. So, <laughs> good you are. Now, what we're going to walk you through today, thank you, is ultimately how we save ourselves time at Font Awesome, the systems we use, and how we make the job of creating icons even easier, both for ourselves and any of you out there that are interested in making your own icons or maintaining an icon library. But how can you even think about saving time when you're staring down the barrel 
of an empty icon canvas? Where do you even start? By figuring out your rules, your constraints, and other design considerations as early as possible. Now, just like in any design system, icon systems are made up of lots of consistent and reusable parts. And just like any design system, you've got to put in the time early to figure out where you can save more time down the road, or, like we say at Fawn Awesome, slowing down to speed up. And this kind of thinking goes all the way down to the very roots of iconography itself, the magnificent grid. Now, grids are a great foundation to keep things consistent and accessible. Even today, in the year of our Lord 2023, not everybody out there is using a fancy schmancy high density display and making sure you're using a grid is gonna help line things up and ensure that the icons you're making are as usable as possible by as many people as possible. And once you've settled on a grid, maybe a nice 24 pixel one like this, you can use key shapes to help keep your icons balanced when they're seen and used together as a set, regardless of their component parts. Now, by and large, icons are based on you know, a handful of core silhouettes. You've got your squares, your circles, your horizontal rectangles and vertical rectangles. And of course, there's variants on all of those things, but guidelines like these are gonna help keep your different shapes harmonious. It's a lot like type design in that way. Now, for a quick example of how they help, Let's take a look at a circle and a square. And I'm sure you've seen hundreds, if not thousands, of icons based on these very simple shapes. And when you're making them, your first instinct might be to make their overall dimensions the same. You know, why not? But what we're dealing with here is more than just dimensions. We're talking about visual density. And once you've released these icons out into the wild and they're being used someplace, how are these two shapes going to stack up? Well, a quick little trick you can do is maybe to add a blur to your icons or unfocus your eyes a little bit, or you know, if you're like me, you can take off your glasses and you cannot see anything at all. Uh, and when you do, the square is going to invariably feel heavier than the circle because those extra little corners pack a surprising punch. So let's try using key shapes to find something a little bit more balanced. If you keep your eye on the square and we just kind of squish it down a tiny bit, it feels a little bit better, right? When we're dealing with shapes at such a small scale, shaving off even just a couple pixels can make a huge difference. And now these are just basic starting points, of course, but they still provide a great foundation for consistency, and they can be easily translated into all sorts of different pictograms in any manner of styles, helping to guide how their forms relate to each other. Maybe something a little bit squishier, like this one, or maybe you know a sturdy, powerful workhorse icon set that comes in multiple styles for any use case. Or maybe something a little blockier, a little more a little more retro. Or maybe something calligraphy inspired, maybe more like a chisel tip pen. Or what about icons? They could even be their own buttons. What? We truly live in an age of wonders. Whoa. Actually, you know, th this gives me an idea. I want to try something with everybody, a little audience participation, regardless of style. There's a few sneaky little things that we do when we're making an icon set or checking it for inconsistencies. And you've probably all seen interfaces where one or more of the icons doesn't seem to quite fit in. Maybe it wasn't made quite right or there's a mishmash of styles going on. So let's see if we can all work together, even you, to see if we can find some, uh, some imposters. So we're going to start with an easy one. So ignore for now what the icons represent. We'll just talk about style. One of these things is not like the other. If you think you know what it is, go ahead and shout it out all together so folks online can hear too. What do you think? Which one doesn't quite match? Three. Number five. Eh, tricky. Yes, number three, this crab doesn't have enough meat on its bones. No, wait, they don't, bones? Almost everybody was correct except for one of you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be talking to you after class. Let's try something a little bit more difficult. This one has an interesting mix of both round and sharp elements kind of going on, but all of the stroke ends, those terminals, should still be treated the same way. What, which of these do you think isn't uh, quite pulling its weight? One. one? Are you all designers? You know what you're doing. Yes, number one, something's going on there in the bottom right. We'll do one more. Back to a little uh, squishy icon set here, but not everything is squishy in paradise. One of these is uh, sticking out a little bit. What do you think the problem might be? Two, a little more uh, division on that one. For some reason, the top of this trophy is a little sharp. Somebody broke in there and filed it down. So by and large, good job. Give yourselves a hand. That's really good. I mean, that's honestly a lot of the nitty gritty work when it comes to keeping an icon set consistent, a lot of those little things. Or when you say recreating an entire icon library from scratch in a new style, but who would ever do such a thing? Uh, we did. 
And <laughs> all because a little promise was made a few years back in the Font Awesome 6 launch video that sharp icons would eventually be added. Um, I don't know, brave or foolhardy to promise such a thing? Well, because it let me fool Font Awesome into hiring me, I'm going to say the latter. And once I came on board, it was up to me to help raise our new little sharp family. And our work on Sharp actually began by taking stock of what makes Font Awesome classic. You know, awesome. What are the rules that keep it all bound together into a big happy family? And what are some of those stylistic attributes that we talked about just a second ago that we could identify? And once we nailed down some of those specifics, we knew what we could tweak to make something new and crispy and yet still familiar. But you know, there's a lot of choices you have to make when you're recreating an entire icon library in a new style. Decisions you make for icon number three are not necessarily going to hold up anymore when you get to icon number 3000. So we did the same thing you do on Left Overnight. We took everything, we threw it into a big pot, we stirred it up, and we saw how it tasted, which really meant we mixed everything into a giant grid and checked it for cohesion many times, which does add time onto production, but it comes in super handy for ensuring consistency across entire styles. And checking all of our attributes early at that stage really helps speed things up for the rest of the development for Sharp Solid, um, Sharp Regular, which I do believe they have sharp pretzels over in the food hall, but I do not recommend them. They will cut your mouth to ribbons. Uh, our most recently released Sharp style, Sharp Light. And soon, fingers crossed, Sharp Thin. Now, if there were a chair out here on stage that I could sit on backwards like a cool guidance counselor, and I would, but you know, because bucko, rules rule when it comes to icons. Embracing constraints is one of the most valuable things you can do in icon design, or any design for that matter. And not only is it going to save you a ton of headaches down the road if you both plan for them and understand them, but it allows your creativity to flourish once you have narrowed down your scope. Yeah. There you go. <clears throat> we were told that you had to high five when you hand the, the clicker off. <laughs> uh, so um, now, if using rules to create icons saves us time, what about the rules that create icons? Like the, the nitty gritty stuff, the ones and the, the zeros, the maths. Now, I am not a mathematician. Okay, I'm an icon designer. I know I <laughs> probably look like one, but no, are you, are you a mathematician? Not even close. No, he probably wouldn't tell me if he were. He's a sneaky, sneaky man. Anyway, I'm not a mathematician, but you know who is a mathematician? This guy. This is Mr. George Boole. He's an English mathematician who in 1854 laid the groundwork for Boolean logic, or binary logic, which is the foundation of modern computing today. Now, Boolean logic is based on the principles of true and false, yes or no, one or zero, George Boole or George Cool. Now, I call him George Cool because his Boolean logic, well, it helps us make awesome icons. <laughs> How so, you ask? Well, with these tools, okay? These are Pathfinder tools. You find them in most vector editing apps, and they use Boolean operations to tell shapes how to interact with one another. Now, the options are typically union, subtract, intersect, and exclude. In the Figma user interface, you'll find these tools up at the top of the Figma screen under this little drop-down menu when you have multiple shapes selected. So how does this work in practice, right? How do we use these tools to help us make awesome icons? Well, it's funny you should ask because we have that process queued up right here. It's, it's almost like we planned it. <coughs> so we're going to start with a little circle here. This is outline mode. You can see all the, the little vector nodes there that created this circle. This is Noah's favorite mode in all the world. Yep, he's very happy. Now, we're going to draw another circle on top of that circle. And then we're going to use a subtract command, that Pathfinder command, that Boolean operation there, to subtract the top shape out from the bottom shape. And we are left with a crescent, or as we like to say in icon design, a moon. <laughs> all right, let's draw something a little bit more complicated. I present you with an alarm clock icon. So let's see how this one was made. We're going to start with that same circle, OK? And then we're going to draw and outline the hands of the clock. We're going to subtract those out from the main shape there. Then we're going to draw and outline the little footsies. Then we're going to draw some bells on top. We're going to do a little cutout of that. We're going to subtract that out from the bells. And then finally, we're going to merge everything together, union everything together into the final icon. So if we take a peek behind the curtain of this icon here, 
We're back to outline mode. Noah is really, really happy right now. We've got ourselves a single exportable shape, a compound path. Everything has been merged together. You could deliver it to your clients. You can upload it to a shared library, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You are done. But wait. What if you made a mistake with that icon? Or you, I don't know, you want to make a change. You want to have square end caps instead of rounded ones. You want the clock to read 3 o'clock instead of 4.30. So unfortunately, that icon, as we just described it, was created using a series of destructive steps. The strokes were all outlined, the shapes were cut out, everything was finally merged together. So if we wanted to make a change to that icon, we would, I don't know, we'd have to redraw it. We'd have to use Command-Z, go back until we had all those steps before everything was merged together. And, and if we do that, do we keep all those individual steps, the, the original stuff we created, or do we keep the exported icon? Do we keep them in the single file, in multiple files? Do we keep them in different folders? What do we do? How do we, what is the source of truth? It is all very, very, very frustrating. <laughs> But the great news is, with Figma, you don't actually need to make this choice. Because Figma treats Mr. George Boole's logic a little bit differently than a lot of apps. The Pathfinder tools in Figma are known as Boolean groups, or, as I like to say, Coolian groups. Now, I don't know, I wasn't paying super close attention yesterday during the keynote, but I think amidst all the talk of variables and everything, that was... This is an official name change, yeah, right? Yeah, Dylan mentioned it. It's, it's in, the, in the next release. It's yeah, yeah, you can look forward to that. And, and Figma, if not, that's a, it's a free gift from us to you. So in Figma, a Boolean group is edible. I mean, editable. Or ed ed that's one of those words that kind of loses meaning. But I think if we, uh, we could actually use that as a, as a metaphor, because like, I think a Boolean group, a good way to explain it is like a recipe, okay? So like, let's imagine we had the ability to use a Boolean group in the real world, okay? This magical world we live in. And we wanted to, I don't know, like um, create an apple pie, make an apple pie. So if we were creating an apple pie using a Boolean group, we would gather all our ingredients together, the apples, the sugar, the flour, etc., cetera, your, your strokes, your shapes, your end caps. We'd mix them together, okay? And then we bake it perfectly. <laughs> Aha! You have a lovely apple pie. It smells delicious. It's out of the oven. It was created using a Boolean group. You're about to cut into it to have a slice, and you have a change of heart. You decide that you don't want an apple pie anymore. You want a cherry pie. Well, thankfully, this fake apple pie here was created using a Boolean group, so that is actually, that's possible. You could actually reach into the apple pie, swap the apple out for cherry, and the pie would still be fully baked and ready to eat and smelling delicious. So a Boolean group is essentially like a recipe that's editable, right? So back to our alarm clock. That means that you actually, in Figma, you do not need to choose between final and editable. With Boolean groups, you get both. The shapes and the strokes remain intact, and then the exported SVG is still a single shape. You can have your pie and eat it too. <laughs> yeah, thank you. No, okay, <laughs> moving on. Anyway, um, in the context of the Figma user interface, so a Boolean group is essentially like an expandable layer group, okay? So that top layer there, is the, if you ex export that, that becomes an SVG that's a single compound path. But each of the interior layers use Boolean operations to tell those shapes how to interact with one another, the unions, the subtractions, et cetera. And the best part about all of this, the thing that makes us as icon designers like, you know, giddy, is that you can combine strokes and shapes in a Boolean group. You don't have to outline the strokes first. So that means that even though you get the single exported shape as an SVG, within the Boolean group itself, you can change those little footsies to be squared end caps. You can make the clock um, hand uh, use a wider width if you want. You can make all these editable changes, which is, which is am amazing. Now, Boolean groups are great, okay, because, because of what we just talked about, they save us a ton of time, and it allows us to update icons on the fly, which is important for us at Font Awesome because we have what we like to call a living library. And that means that as time goes on, we have the ability to release new versions and that change is possible. So this is the user icon from version four of Font Awesome. You've probably seen it all over the internet. Uh, got the little hunched shoulders there. So this is actually my introduction to Font Awesome before I worked for the company. It's everywhere. <laughs> no, Dave, I'm not changing the slide yet. Um, 
uh, it's, a, it's a great little icon. Now, when we released version 5 of Fawn Awesome, we made some minor changes to the icon. We massaged the shoulders a bit, drooped them down, got some tension out of there, made the head a little bit bigger. And then actually further on in version 5, we made some even further changes to make it a little bit more readable at smaller sizes, and actually ultimately to make it work better with different variations. And then finally, this is the version 6 user icon for Fawn Awesome. This is what's out there today. It's live today. It's a little flexible, more flexible, a little bit more cleaner. Now, all four of these icons were drawn from scratch, okay? And that's fine. There are only four icons here. It didn't take us a ton of time. But with version 5, we made a number of variations to that user icon here. And then with version 6, we made all those same variations, but in the new kind of simpler style, plus a whole lot more. Okay, we have a ton of different variations here. We got a little Shakespeare icon there up in the top corner, all different stuff. So what if we wanted to make a change to that user icon, okay? Or we need to release a new version or fix an issue. Well, as we said, thankfully this icon was created using a Boolean group, so change is possible. So the icon's still editable. So like if we were to, I don't know what, um, if we wanted to add like a mullet to all of our user icons, we could. Okay, it's a Boolean group, it's pretty easy. You can just make a few minor changes here and there. And I'm looking at you and I, I know you're looking at me and you're looking at that mullet up there and you're thinking to yourself, Jory, I bet, I bet you'd look great with a mullet. Prove it. <laughs> I will. <Prove> it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I spent way too much time customizing an Apple Memoji. That hairstyle doesn't exist, so I had to make it from scratch. <laughs> Now, OK, what if we wanted to add a mullet to all of our user icons, OK? Now, even with a Boolean group, we'd still have to change every single icon one by one. It would take forever. So like, if only there were a feature in Figma that like, allowed us to what? Like, re reuse elements across designs. I mean, I, I think there is. There is? Yeah. There is. They're called components, which you're probably familiar with, OK? Now, if you use components in Figma, you likely use them for user interface elements, like your buttons or your cards or your menu items, et cetera. You can even use them to swap out icons. But the key for us as icon designers, the game changer was when we realized that you could combine components and Boolean groups together. This means that with icon design, we have the ability to reuse elements across icons that share a similar base. So like in the case of this car icon here, if we were to turn this car into a component, we could then create an instance, different instances of that component. And if we wanted to, we could add, I don't know, side view mirrors to one of the cars. We could add a little sign on top to make it into a taxi cab. And then because the base is a component, we could merge it together using a Boolean group and then we're left with three unique icons. Now, in the Figma UI, those are those little expandable layer groups there. The component of the car is that base, and then we've, in this case, the case of both of these icons here, we've used the union command to merge those extra elements with it. And if you export that top layer there, you're, you have a single compound path. And this is great because it means that if you make a change to that base component there, that, that car, it cascades to all the instances that use the same component. So it makes, Updating icons when you have different variants of them, or, or you want to make a new style, well, it makes it as easy as pie, which is a callback for any of you <laughs> paying attention here. So, okay, back to the user icon, okay? So if we were to turn this user icon into a component, we could then add some modifying elements to it. That base element becomes the component there remains consistent across all of the variations, and under the hood, essentially what we've created here is we're using that component we have a little element here that we're cutting out, and then we use subtract to punch out of that main shape there. And then we have a unique element, this gear, that we're going to union together. But this got us thinking, that gear is pretty handy. Like, what if we wanted to add that gear to a lot of icons or different icons or make that possible? So we thought, what if we turn each of those elements into components? Because then everything becomes modular. Now, a big caveat here is you don't need to do this for every single icon. This is super helpful for those that you know are going to have multiple variations or you're going to want to reuse a number of times, which we do in Fawn Austin to give folks as many options as they can have. It saves us a ton of time. And because now each of those modifying elements there, those little things hanging off the corner, are components, we can then add different base icons to those modifiers as well. And then the changes, if you make them to either thing, will cascade 
across all instances, which makes updates super, super easy, and especially if you want to make a new style. And yes, we can now add that mullet to all of our user icons. We could. My clicker works. There we go. See? I told you. It's great. So, okay, how does this actually work in practice? Well, we've essentially created unique components for all of our core icons and all of our modifiers. And the style and family variants within Font Awesome are actually baked right into those components as variants. We're using a shared library in Figma, which means that we can make updates and, and it cascades to all of our different files. And then you can see here that you can swap out this Boolean, this is an actual Boolean group that's created already. And within that Boolean group, you can pop in there and change the modifier to something else. You can change the style to something else. It saves us a ton of time. And uh, internally, I'm going to ask that this doesn't leave this room, or for folks watching from their own homes, please keep this hush hush. But we have a code name for this. And that code name is Fawn Awesome Reusable Tidbits and Shapes. Which is. Um, Probably figured. <laughs> farts. Now, at Fawn Awesome, we have a lot of farts. And although it would be possible to add a fart to every single one of our icons, I don't know, it's impractical, okay? You know, it just takes a lot of time. And we've talked about this is all about saving time. So we don't want to add that to every single icon. But we want to allow people to add a fart to every single icon. So Instead of doing this manually, instead of no one I sitting there at our computer, you know, manually adding it to every single icon, we bottled up our farts, and we magically transformed them into what we call the icon wizard. And the icon wizard is this little uh, customer-facing tool that you can access from our website that allows you to easily add a modifier to any single font awesome icon on an as-needed basis. And you save it to a font awesome kit. You can download it. You can serve it up just like any other icon. Now, under the hood, this icon wizard is actually using the exact same Boolean operations that Figma uses to create your different pathfinder, your different shapes there. Now, as I said earlier, I'm not a mathematician, but like, I think that, that would be like a lot, a lot of icons would be possible with this. Like, Noah, like if we were to take, oh, oh, you did have more yellow on you, you jerk. If you were to take like, all of our icons, all of our styles, all of our icon families, all the modifiers, the new modifiers we're working on, some of the new icons we're working on, that would be like how many icons? I don't know, like 750,000, give or take. Yeah, so, I mean, you could say that we drew 750,000 icons in Figma, and so can you. I mean, yeah. even me? Even I could do that? <laughs> Noah, even you. <sighs> yeah. I mean, that's... That's really great because... No, we got a high five first. All right, you deserve it. Okay. Yes. Because that is a lot of farts for just one person to handle, which is no laughing matter, but, but I don't want to hear it, okay? Organizing such important material requires the utmost care and attention, okay? We realized we needed somewhere very special to hold our farts. Keeping everything together was the smart play for managing all those itty-bitty pieces in both the classic and sharp styles, like the base icons, facial elements for emoji, people in poses that get used all the time, the cutouts to subtract the negative space around modifiers, all the modifiers themselves, and lots of other little elements that get overlaid onto icons sometimes. And here's a little, uh, a brief slice of it in all its glory. Excited to see what we can do with some of the new variable features on this too. But um, now by adding sharp, we doubled our icons. And it was clear that Unlike our farts, one giant file was not going to cut the cheats, okay? Thank you. I worked hard on that one. With me coming on board and all of these new collaborative tools and processes at our disposal, there had to be a better way. We had to let them be free. Now, for a little context, our icons are organized into, you know, roughly 25-ish different Figma files. And this helps speed things up when it comes to adding new icons and editing existing ones, but also helps with uh, library publish times and file load times, but we really wanted an easy way to track changes uh, across all these files without having to rely on extra layers of complexity or plugins or anything like that. So we put our heads together, Jory and me, and we realized we could do a lot with a little, the humble file thumbnail. And in Figma, that categorization looks a little bit like this uh, in the midst of our sharpening process. 
And here's a quick peek at how that looks in action. So for every category, we had a component with variants set up within it, so we would know when, um, before work had begun on a specific category. And then once someone had started making progress, we could easily dive in, change its status and color, and go style by style and family by family, and toggle on what work had been completed so that we could see at a glance at any point in our whole library how things were going. And then once that category was completed, turn nice and green. And then after that point, um, if we have any changes that need to be updated in our database or other things that change, we can add a nice little flag at the top right so that we can keep track of everything that's going on. And these days, this is how things are looking. Green and clean, baby. <clears throat> and we'll move on. Well, I see what you're saying. <laughs> it's just a button, Noah. You just I know. click the button. I'm there afraid of the button. Even though these files are separate, though, we still publish everything uh, together as an icon component library so that everybody's working with the latest assets, no matter who they are in the company, marketing, development, design, everybody's working on the same page. Now, in the background there, you might tell that there's a couple different colored columns of icons, and that's because we use a very simple, lightweight color coding system so that we can track the status of any given icon, regardless of which of those 25 files it lives in. And I'll tell you more about it now. Using this lets us see at a glance uh, what was next on deck, for example, as we progressed through sharpening the entire library. Or we could easily grab any type of icon all at once with Figma's color selection targeting. Now, of course, this kind of lightweight approach, only relying on color, isn't going to work for everybody. But it's just small and lightweight enough that it works for the two of us. Now, as an example, most categories, they look like this now, you know? Classic and sharp, side by side. and delicious flame broiled harmony, but sometimes the editing goes wrong. Maybe an icon, you know, something goes wrong with the editing, or something doesn't mesh into a Boolean group quite right, or maybe you stepped away for only five minutes and somebody stole your french fries. I was hungry. But, uh, you know, so we can flag that one red. I love technology, it's so great. Maybe the base glyphs uh, for only a couple styles has changed, like maybe in your solid and your duotone styles. So those have to be updated in your database too, so we can flag those easily. Um, or maybe uh, in the midst of the sharp build out, we could easily duplicate all of our classic icons and flag them yellow so we knew which ones still needed to be sharpened. Or maybe uh, a hot new drink flavor comes out on the scene and you just got to add it to your icon library. So we can flag those as blue. Blue for new, I think that was the thought process behind that. And now that all these systems are set up and functional, it makes adding new modifiers and icons easy as pie. That's, <laughs> that's a third callback, in case you were, in case you were keeping track. The Thank student you so much. has become the master. The power. Let's move on. But no joke, building a system for updates and organization makes working at scale so much easier. There you go. All right. Speaking of scale, so we have this whole large icon system, all right? And that's, that's, that's great for us for in Figma for, for building icons. But what about actually using the icons? And specifically, what about using icons in Figma? So you may have noticed, and we mentioned it earlier, but we work at Font Awesome. And there is a specific part of that name, the font, that I want to focus on here for a second. Because Font Awesome, when it was originally created back in 2012, was took advantage of web font technology to serve icons in kind of the same way that you serve typefaces. And over the years, we have a lot of new ways to use icons. We have SVGs, et cetera, et cetera. But one way that we still actually take advantage of those fonts is with our desktop files, the OTF font files, that are available in a ton of different formats. But the thing in the OTF font files that we really use are the ligatures. And now ligatures, if you're familiar with typography, is like when you, um, when you write like the letters F and L, you'll see them sometimes merged together into a single glyph there, the little combined shape, the little full. Yeah, is that, I don't know. Whether. Oh. Anyway, so we're using that same technology, but instead of changing an F and L to a full, we're changing the word house into a house. So if you just type the name of the icon, it swaps out the glyph which essentially means like we've packed our entire icon library into a typeface. And what's really cool is that Figma actually has Font Awesome 5 
free and Fun Awesome 6 free installed by default. So you have access to this today if you're using Figma. This is in, in your Figma interface. So we thought, what if we took that technology and the fact that it's installed by in Figma by default and used components to make it even cooler? So we did. It's available in the Fun Awesome community. It's our Fun Awesome official icon component, and it harnesses ligatures and then also component variant properties, and most specifically the text variant property to allow us to like let you easily swap out one icon for another. And it looks like this in practice. Basically, you can type a different icon name in that bottom field there, and it'll swap out the icon. We have style, padding, and scale baked right into it. And we actually use this internally all the time for all of our user interface designs because this is one little thing that you can cut and paste and just reuse over and over again. And essentially, we've like basically packed our whole icon system, not just the individual families, but the whole system into a single Figma component, which saves us a ton of time. And that's, that's kind of what we want to leave you with, that when you look at our entire system for creating and delivering icons from the, the file organization, those thumbnails that Noah shared, to the components, Boolean groups, styling and key shapes, all the way down to the, the itty bitty little icon grid there. It's all about saving time so that we can focus on what's more important, most important. That's right, a well-balanced breakfast. I mean, icons, Yeah, icons. Uh, you know, and we do that by building just the right amount of structure that works for us, you know, you know being flexible enough to allow exploration still, but both befriending and being creative within our constraints. You know, going back to the beginning, maybe, Maybe we should have named our talk something a little bit different. Maybe the real friends were the icons we made along the way. No, 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 scratch that, reverse it. Yeah. Yes, the real icons were the friends we made along the way. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining Thank us for our talk. Have a lovely rest of config. Um, see you later.